A little background on myself. I'm an Illinois native. This is going to be my 40th crop year. Um, I started in the other camp, is what I like to tell people, back in 1978. and I uh, was a district manager for a retail fertilizer and chemical plant in central Illinois. Uh, back when the average farm size in that area was still about four or five hundred acres, there were still probably quite a bit of three-year crop rotations going on with small grains, corn, and soybeans. A lot of farms still had cattle or hogs on the farm, excuse me. Um, we went into the 1980s, which wasn't a very good time for many farmers, as many of you might remember, with extremely low grain prices. Uh, we endured three droughts within eight years in Illinois at that time and one monsoon rainy summer also, which didn't help crop prices or crop production. Uh, I sold the fertilizer business in 1988 and, and wanted to continue working in, with farmers in, in production agriculture, but I noticed that things were changing a lot. Herbicides were changing, production practices, conservation tillage, uh, No-till was making its second run at becoming popular because it failed pretty miserably in the early 80s, the first time that it was introduced. So I decided to go back to grad school at the University of Illinois and I received my degree in 1993 in weed management and agronomy. I moved my family to Minnesota to work for a major seed company in southwest Minnesota. Uh, then we moved again to central Minnesota where I worked for another seed company but when I moved to Minnesota, that's where I became very focused on uh, uh, non-GMO seed production uh, for both just general production and for food grade production. I started becoming more aware of organic production and that's where my focus, is, uh, my focus started to change a little bit and I, I, I did a lot of self-study, uh, working with farmers and just taking courses and things like that to become more involved and more aware with food grade production, both non-GMO and organic, which led me to my current position at Grain Millers, which I've been here now for almost eight years. I wanna talk a little bit about, or quite a bit about pre and post harvest handling and storage of organic grains. I'm just gonna talk about the basics Everybody's got a different operation. You've got different crops, different circumstances, different equipment, different storage capabilities. But what I'm going to relate here is information that our growers have given to us over the years from things that have worked for them or haven't worked for them. If you've got any comments, suggestions, ideas, raise your hand. I'm, I'm willing to share those with the group too. So. Um, for today's discussion, I'm going to concentrate on three food grade crops that we work with at grain millers. Uh, oats being the number one crop that we work with, uh, food grade corn, and food grade soybeans. As Bruce mentioned in his presentation yesterday, and we mention this a lot to our contract growers, is yeah, you know, technically you're producing a grain. We understand that. We, we like to get them in the mindset that you're producing a food ingredient. Because everything that we buy from you is for food grade uh, production and for human consumption. For soybeans we have, of which I work with quite a bit in our specialty grains division. Um, so Craig, I know you're trying to um, uh, save your voice, but I'm gonna try to see if we can get the okay. mic a little bit more adjusted for you. All right, thank you. Or maybe use a different mic? We'll try this one here. I'll stand you a little closer. To, yeah, so you might just want to adjust it tonight. Uh, soybeans, uh, we export most of the food grade soybeans that we contract grow at grain millers. Um, most of that goes into tofu production, soy milk production, soy sauce, miso, and natto. Uh, some of it domestically is, is used for those same uh, food uh, products, uh, and some of it goes into some companies that We'll make a protein isolate from the soybean, and that'll go into your power bars, the energy drinks, hospital food, things like that. Uh, for corn, we have a corn mill in Marion, Indiana. Uh, we've got you know corn flour, grits, cones, uh, and we also deal with some companies that uh, buy corn from us, uh, food grade corn, 
that goes into masa production for tortillas and corn chips. And then the oats, you've got the rolled oats there in the top uh, left-hand corner, the steel cut oats down in the bottom center, and then my favorite, hopefully it all ends up in oatmeal cookies. Before we talk about harvest uh, concepts and storage concepts, I think we need to take a step back. And before we harvest that crop and put it into a bin, we need to know what we're working with. So uh, uh, let's take a walk in your fields sometime before harvest, whether that be before a small grain harvest or a soybean or corn harvest, and, and do some field inspection work. Get to know the varieties and the hybrids that you're working with what their strong points are and what their limitations are. You know, uh, standability, ear retention, um, uh, disease resistance, things like that. You know, identify potential problem areas in the field, low spots, wet spots, weedy areas, and then develop a harvest plan uh, for those types of conditions, whether they be weeds, uh, diseases that are gonna uh, reduce yields and maybe cause uh, harvest con uh, concerns, um, ear molds, which have been quite a factor the last couple of years. More specifically for oats, uh, wild oats become quite a problem a lot of times in oat production. Uh, they're not uh, something we like to see when, they, when we bring them to the plant at St. Ansgar. So if, if wild oats is a concern in your field, uh, especially during that particular year where you are harvesting oats, you may need to consider pre-cleaning the oats to get quite a few of those out before they arrive at the plant. Things like crown rust, barley yellow, dwarf virus, stem rust uh, are going to limit your yields and maybe cause some storage concerns where you may want to pre-clean the oats going into your storage bin so that they do uh, store a little bit nicer for you and hopefully make food grade quality when you bring them to the oatmeal. In corn, the last couple of years have been a real challenge with the prolonged harvest and the wet harvest that we've been having, not just here in Wisconsin, but throughout the Midwest. Uh, the ear molds uh, weren't quite as bad in 2017, but 2016 was a nightmare in many areas for ear molds and mycotoxins. Uh, Aspergillus ear rot is, is fairly common throughout the corn belt, especially during hot and dry growing conditions. <laughs> and aflatoxins may concern with the development of this ear mold. Fusarium ear mold is a very common fungal disease on corn ears. Again, normally after warm and dry conditions after silking, which we really haven't had too much of here in the last couple of years. It's either been cool and wet or warm and wet. In 2006, uh, we had quite a problem with diplodia ear rot, uh, very wet, in warm August and September, uh, which in some areas lasted well through September, October, and even November. It was a, uh, it was a challenging harvest year. Um, this, this disease just really exploded in a lot of fields. The, the corn plant itself wasn't maturing properly. The husks were being held tight, and with all that rain and warm weather we had, the, the ear mold, the, the diplodia ear rot just really took off in a lot of fields. And then finally, we have gibberell ear rot, uh, very common in the northern and eastern Corn Belt areas. It tends to like a cooler temperature, but wet weather. I thought we'd see a little bit more of this in 2017. We did have the cooler August and September, but we weren't uh, in many areas quite as wet as uh, it needed to be for this disease to, to develop. Soybeans, a uh, common occurrence is white mold. Uh, you're usually going to start seeing this in, in mid to late August. It does infect the plant during flowering, so late June through July, but you're not going to see the result of this infection until close to harvest time. Um, the plants usually die. If there is some seed on the plant, it's usually very small. Sometimes it gets kicked out the back of the combine. We can clean it out fairly early, but it's in the storage of the soybeans and with all the sclerotia that is in the bin that can cause some storage concerns and maybe cause some hot spots in the bin if you don't keep it clean. Uh, pod, and stem plight, pod and stem blight will also happen in, uh, uh, in fields where we have a kind of a, a wet fall. Uh, again, you're gonna have uh, poorly developed soybeans in the pod if there are any. Uh, and sometimes they're, they're very diseased, and once that gets into your bin, you can also have some storage concerns there. 
with phytophthora root rot, uh, this usually takes the plant early in the year, but it can develop late in the growing season also, uh, where maybe only part of the plant dies off by the time it's, it's ready for harvest. And you're gonna have a uh, seed that's either small or shriveled or, or somewhat uh, diseased and infected. And again, we could have storage concerns there also. I work a lot with non-GMO and organic food grade soybeans, so uh, I guess I'm most knowledgeable about, about this, this crop here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the goal is the picture in the middle. Nice, clean seed coats, uh, free of dirt and weed seed staining. Uh, that's what our customers like to see. That's what they want to buy from us, and if they don't see that and they see one of the other pictures surrounding this one in the middle, they're very apt to reject our beans once they get to Japan or to their delivery point here in the United States. The upper left-hand corner, it's kind of hard to see. They look pretty good, but uh, it may be in another picture, uh, you'll see a, a light, what I call robin's egg speckling to them. It's just little tiny black, black dots of dirt or weed seed staining that happen when uh, possibly some moisture is accumulated in the combine from harvesting too early in the day or too late in the day when you have some, uh, some of the dew setting in. If you go through a weedy patch, you're gonna be introducing some moisture into the combine and when that happens, it collects the dust and dirt that's in the combine, it settles on the seed coat and we get that speckling. Um, it's a little more evident in the bottom left-hand corner picture uh, and then as we get to the right side there, we've got some actual muddy seed. And in the bottom right hand corner, we've got uh, an absolute mess there with muddy seed coats, stained seed coats from either weed seeds or uh, purple seed coat staining. Uh, the only one that's gonna be acceptable for food grade production is the one in the middle. We do have technology at the cleaning plant, color sorters, roll sorters, uh, destoners to, to really help clean the seed and improve it in its quality. But when it comes to seed coat staining, it's really hard for especially the color sorters to pick out just the ones with the spots. Uh, if it's a really dirty seed mixed in uh, very lightly with some good clean seed coats, that's really easy to clean out for the color sorter. But when we get the light speckling or the robin's egg speckling, um, uh, we're we're going to kick out a lot of good seed coats along with the, that spotted seed to get it uh, to where it meets specifications for our customers. Yeah. Now that we've uh, walked our fields and found out what we have for problem areas or potential problem areas we need to get ready for harvest and uh, we want to start with uh, clean grain handling equipment and even before we start cleaning I want everybody to remember that safety is first. You know use lockout tag out procedures, dust masks when you're getting in the grain bins, uh, make sure power supplies are cut off so there aren't any accidents. We want to clean the grain carts and wagons, semis and hopper trailers. Make sure that the hopper bottoms and slide, slide gates are, are cleaned out, especially where that slide gate goes through. Beans and other grains uh, can hang up in there for quite a long time and some of them will start to mold or get kind of kind of, kind of uh, mushy and we want to get all that cleaned out so it doesn't affect the grain that you're going to put in there during harvest. Make sure you clean in and around the tarp that's on the hopper um, if you have those especially where it attaches to the top of the truck. There's a little seam in there. The grain can get kind, kind of hung up in quite a bit. Uh, I know if you use a commercial truck driver, he, he doesn't even think about that, but make sure that he's gone in there and kind of swept that out or uh, use some type of brush to dig the, the grain that's getting stuck in there uh, out because a lot of times we find a lot of moldy grain underneath that tarp. And believe it or not, when they roll that tarp back and forth, you think the grain's gonna fall off to the ground. Many times it falls right into the hopper. Use compressed air, brushes, vacs. If you have to, wash it out with a garden hose. Bins and conveyors, uh, flush with grain, and then store it separately. 
Um, if you're use, uh, getting ready to harvest corn or soybeans, you can use oats or wheat to flush out augers and grain handling equipment. It works very well. Uh, again, store it separately, use it for feed, or take it to the elevator. Uh, wood chips work very well. When I was in the seed business, we had a lot of guys that would go to Fleet Farm and buy a bag of wood chips, run it through their floor augers and their bins, through their uh, uh, augers that they used to load their bins with. And uh, if a few wood chips would come in with the seed, when we brought it to the cleaning plant, it was very easy to clean out. While you're cleaning out your augers, also check for the uh, auger fighting for wear. Uh, they do last a long time, but if they start getting little nicks or wear points in there where they're gonna pinch the bean or the corn against the flighting, um, that's where you're gonna get cracks and seed coat damage, and that's gonna possibly increase the clean out, decrease the quality, and, and affect your premium for that quality grain. Storage bins need to be kernel clean. Uh, again, compressed air, sweeping them out is the best way. I know it's a messy, hot job because you're going to be doing it in August, but really to ensure that you've got uh, all the old grain out, uh, the cobwebs, any bugs that might be lingering around, uh, you need to get in there and do that because that's one of the best ways to prevent storage molds from occurring. Uh, Clean off all the ledges, the ladders, the sump holes, the unload system. Again, use those wood chips or a small grain to clean that out. Again, look at your auger flighting. Make sure it's uh, in good condition. Uh, if you've got a false floor there for drying or for aeration, if you can get under there and take a look and, and make sure you don't have any uh, rodents hanging around or any holes in the floor that could cause uh, grain to leak down and mold underneath the floor, that's going to be beneficial also. Corn can quickly create a cocktail of molds if it's been left in the bin for uh, you know, a year or two and then you put new grain on top of there. And you, you've basically introduced the pathogen even before you've got the new crop in the bin. You could do everything possible to uh, put a good quality crop in your bin, but if you've got some old crop in there, uh, whether it be corn, beans, or even uh, corn cobs or something that were in there from the previous harvest, they can contain uh, molds and mycotoxins which will very readily spread throughout the grain mass that you're going to put in that storage bin. Check your bins to make sure that they're sealed to prevent water penetration. Look around that bottom ring there to make sure no water can get in there. Check around your doors. Make sure they, they seal tight up on top of the bin. Make sure the hatches are tight and, and uh, make sure your vent openings are covered so you don't uh, get birds flying in there, insects or other rodents uh, that can infect or infest your grain. Then repair any holes in the storage or bin floor or walls just to make sure water doesn't penetrate or, or pests don't get inside the bin. We'll move on to uh, pre-harvest prep for all crops with, with combines. Um, you want to clean out between crops, especially if you have parallel production. I know some of you are 100% organic, some of you are tr transitioning to organic, so you might have some non-GMO production, and possibly some of you hire your combining done, but you want to make sure that that combine is kernel clean. Row crop head, reel, take those off, clean them out completely, then move to the feeder house, the augers, the elevators, ledges, anywhere other crops can get hung up or stuck in that combine. What I usually have guys to do is, uh, again, take the row crop head off, take the reel off, clean that separately, uh, then open up the combine completely. Open up all the uh, uh, elevator doors, anything that where grain can leak out, start up that combine and run it and just shake it for about five or ten minutes and just shake any grain that you can get out of there to come out. Once that's done, stop the combine, make sure you've secured the power source, uh, get in there with a shop vac or compressed air and get as much grain out as you possibly can. Once you think that's complete, you know, keep all the doors and traps open, start that combine back up again, let it run and shake out again see if any more grain will fall out of it. 
Uh, if you have to shut it off, uh, well, we'll get, go ahead and shut it off and uh, maybe get back here with the, with the uh, shop vac or the, the air hose and, and get a little bit more grain out. But then go ahead and button it up. And then when you head out to that first field, um, purge the combine with one or 200 feet of, of that next crop. Uh, empty that crop into a separate wagon, store it separately or take it to town. Uh, just to make sure that you've got everything out of that combine and you're ready to go for the contracted food grade production that you're going to harvest. I'm going to go into harvest and storage next. Uh, oats and small grains. <clears throat> if you're going to be swathing your oats, uh, we want to target an average kernel moisture of 25% or below. And a good way to check that is to look at the smallest uh, oat grains at the bottom of the head. And when they've just gone from green and changed to that cream color, uh, that's the time to start swathing your oats. They're going to be around 25% at that time. Uh, you have to remember that oats, unlike other small grains, mature from the top down. So make sure that you look at the bottom of that, uh, that oat head there and, and make sure that you've got that cream color before you do swath the oats. If you swath them a little on the green side, that the, the green ones aren't going to mature properly and that's going to affect your, your quality and your test weight. And also remember that the bottom two-thirds of the kernels contain 90% of the oat yield, so it is very important to remember that we get uh, that color change there at the bottom of the oats. Excuse me. Yes? Uh, one thing I have, I've never been around oats to speak of, but do uh, the stripper heads work well on them, you know, where they, you know, like a shell head, where they just strip the heads off. The question was, do the stripper heads work on oats for harvest? Bruce, can you help out with that? I haven't seen you afterwards. The okay. answer is not quite as good, but it just takes a little more careful setting, but we can talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> We're going to straight. Oh, another question? Uh, and maybe you'll get to it. Um, Taking the oats uh, straight versus swathing. Yeah, we're going to jump on that right now. If we're going to straight cut the oats or, or with a combine, uh, the most one of the most important things is to to avoid <coughs> dehull kernels. Uh, it's okay if in the process of harvesting them that the if the glooms come off that that outer layer. But we want to make sure not to peel off the lemma or the paleo, which is the next layer down. What happens when, if, if that happens, oh, it's going to think that it's time to start germinating. And if that gets put in the bin, you might start getting some sprouting, and that's going to be a quality concern, and it won't be acceptable at the mill. Um, when combining or straight cutting oats, you want to slow the cylinder speed and widen the concave clearances, you know, if you have dry conditions. Uh, another th good thing to do is to turn up the, the fan to remove as much FM as possible before you put them in the bin. And I'm not a combine operator. Uh, I'm, I'm going to admit that right now. So you know, please check your manufacturer for settings. Uh, most implement dealers know there's a lot of food grade production out there now. And they have, usually have people, whether it's with John Deere or Case IH or whomever you might have for a combine, they've got people there that can help you set that combine for food grade production. Drying uh, of oats, uh, if you're going to swath them you know, at 25%, once they get down to that 13, 14% range, that's the time to go ahead and, and uh, finish, finish off the job with those. If you're combining them straight cut, you know, you want a target moisture of 12 to 13 percent with oats. Uh, 15 to 18 percent on wheat, so it's uh, a little wetter, uh, but don't let them feel dry too long. Weather might move in. Same with oats, uh, increases the chances of lodging and low test weights if you wait too long. Bin aeration is highly recommended for oats and other specialty crops, uh, especially by filling. It helps w w in small grains, helps remove a lot of the thins and FM, just kind of blows it out of the bin. Uh, oats and small grains a lot of times are harvested in the late summer, so hopefully 
you've got the right moisture going into the bin, but if you do need to bring the moisture down a little bit, we can just use natural air drying. So keep those aeration fans going and they will pull some moisture out. If you do need to actually put some heat to the bin, uh, keep drier temps less than 150 degrees for oats. Uh, maximum grain temperature should be around 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and again, clean, dry storage is the best for oats. Going to switch crops now and go to food grade corn uh, harvesting. Uh, we like to see guys start harvesting food grade corn around 20% moisture. Uh, we don't want it much drier because a lot of times we're going to get a lot of kernel crackage or stress cracks, uh, especially with the hard endosperm corn that we require for use for our mills. Um, keeping it at around 20% moisture and then slowly drying it, either with natural air or low temperature drying, is gonna help minimize breakage uh, from corn being too dry at harvest. Start with a wider concave setting and lower rotor speeds and continually check corn for breakage or damage and adjust the combine accordingly. Um, if you're leaving too much on the cob, you're gonna have to set it a little bit tighter. Uh, if you see too much breakage in the tank, um, you're going to have to open things up just a little bit more. Increase the combine fan uh, speed to help remove the FM in the corn, and that, that goes pretty much for all crops. For reducing GMO contamination, which is a problem in corn uh, because of the way that it does pollinate, and, and we do get a lot of pollen dispersal from GMO to non-GMO and organic fields, uh, regardless of how much border you've put in, how, how much good communication and, and, and uh, 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 relationships you have with your neighbors knowing where their crops are. I think it's important to probably harvest some border rows off your field, store those separately, maybe use them for an organic feed grain or, or even if you have to take them, take them to town because you don't want to contaminate the whole bin of corn for a few border rows that might have had a little bit of cross-pollination from a GMO field. Drying and storage of your food grade corn. Uh, you want to dry it uniformly and you want to dry it with slow, uh, uh, dry it slowly with low temperatures, never above 110 degrees of actual grain temp. You want to use high volumes of air when drying this corn. Uh, and if you're just using natural air, you're going to have to keep pumping that air through the bin. At the same time, once it's leave the, left the dryer, you want to cool it slowly with high volumes of air. You don't want to cool it too fast because it's kind of like glass. If it's really hot and then you dip it in some cold water, it's going to shatter right away. And that's what's going to happen with the hard endosperm corn that we use for food grade corn. Um, you want to, you're drying it down, whether it be two, three, four points, it's a 110 degrees actual grain temp. Use uh, uh, a lot of air and not real cold air to bring that grain temperature back down when it goes into storage. Initially, you want to keep that temperature in the cooling bin above 50 degrees. As that grain temperature comes down, you could start adding cooler air as, as we get, you know, farther into the fall. Uh, and you could actually bring it down to almost freezing, you know, before you lock up the bin for the winter. Food grade corn for most of our customer specifications needs to be dried down to 14 to 14 and a half percent moisture, both for their specifications for use for their products and also it really works good for long term storage in grain bins. Keep grain within 10 degrees of outside ambient air temperatures using your aeration fans as you're drying it. Again, cool the grain slowly on a regular basis until the grain temperature nears freezing. Uh, that's gonna work good for long-term storage. Now, when we get to this time of the year with the temperatures that we have outside like today, and maybe that occurs a little bit later into February or even March, depending upon the winter, uh, we're gonna start to want to warm that grain back up and acclimate it to the outside air temperatures. That way we don't get a lot of uh, sweating inside the bin. We don't create hot spots in the bin where moisture is accumulating, especially if you have a lot of FM or weed seed uh, inside your bin. Uh, that's where that molding is gonna happen as that grain warms up. So uh, 
what you want to do there is turn your fans on and start moving air through it and try and bring the grain temperature up about five degrees at a time to avoid moisture formation in the grain mass. Now once you start that, you've got to make sure that that whole grain mass warms up that five degrees. If you only go halfway and you've got part of the bin warmer than the other part of the bin, you're going to start to get some condensation inside the bin and you're going to have some moisture problems which could affect the quality of the grain. During the summer then, uh, if you've still got uh, corn in your bins in the summertime, which does happen in food grade production, uh, aerate the bin on cool, dry nights to hold grain temps down. It also kind of helps prevent uh, insect infestation from getting ahead of the game there a little bit. They like that warm, musty air in a bin, so if you can move a lot of air through that bin in the summertime, that's going to keep those insects at bay for a little while longer. Now I've talked a lot about hard endosperm corn for food grade corn production. And that's what we use for our mill, uh, our dry mill. And that's what the wet millers like to use for masa production also. I've got a picture there. I hope it shows up on the big screen okay. Uh, this is actually white corn. And by hard endosperm, if you look on the outside of the, the germ there, you can see that translucent color coming through the candling table. That's, I have these, these kernels set out on a candling table. It shines a bright, white, opaque light through the kernel. And if you get that translucent color uh, shining through, that's telling us that you've got a lot of hard or horniest endosperm in that kernel. If you have a lot of dark material there, like you see on that third kernel over from the left, that's, that's heavy starch area. That's going to show up dark. We like to use uh, varieties that are at least 87% plus hard endosperm versus soft starch for our milling procedures. Um, and by when we use corn like that, like I said, we have to, to dry it slowly with, with either natural air or low temperature air, and we want to cool it slowly to prevent the stress cracks. And that picture uh, of the kernel on second from the left shows a stress crack. If we, we heat that corn up, too quickly or too hot and dry it too quickly, we're going to get stress cracks in there. And if we take corn with heavy stress cracks to the mill, it's just going to bust apart. We're not going to be able to separate the, uh, the endosperm and the grit and the germ to make the products that we need. So it's going to reduce the mill yield. For uh, soft milling, for masa production, um, we bring the corn into our location at St. Peter, Minnesota and we, we clean it and we size it for the, the masa millers. Then they take it and they soak it. And if they have a lot of stress cracks in the corn, the soak's gonna be uneven. So it's gonna really throw off the recipes to make their, their, their masa and their corn chips and tortillas. For the most part, for the customers we work with, we like to see the stress crack percentage come in at 15 to 20% or less. Uh, we know we can't make it zero. It's nearly impossible because you're going to get stress cracks during the drying process with hard endosperm. We're just trying to minimize them as much as we can. Now we're going to move to food grade soybeans. Um, combine settings, again, I'm not a combine operator or mechanic, so these are just the basics that my growers have told me work for them. Cylinder and rotor speed, they say three to 400 RPM depending on the model of the combine. Airflow, 1,000 to 1,200 RPM. Again, keep those fans moving, keep, keep that FM blowing out. Uh, even the pods will sometimes come out a little bit more. If you get too many pods in the tank, you want to tighten the concave versus increasing the cylinder or rotor speed. If you've got too many split or damaged soybeans, uh, you want to open the concave and reduce the cylinder or rotor speed if possible. Uh, you also want to calibrate the feed auger reel speed to prevent bunching in the feeder house. We want a nice, even flow through that feeder house into the combine instead of, you know, shoving a bunch of beans in all at once and then being a little bit of a break and then shoving a bunch more beans through there. Uh, we're gonna get a lot of damage if that happens. Also, you wanna keep your returns to the cylinder rotor uh, to a minimum. Basically, you don't wanna handle those beans in the combine any more than you have to. Again, check with your manufacturer or owner's manual for more information on these settings. Um, 
if anybody has any comments on wor wor what works best for them, I'm always willing to listen and uh, get a new set of notes on that. Food grade soybeans, uh, again, uh, combine and truck unloading. Uh, I like to see guys decrease the auger speed when unloading. I, I've ridden a lot of combines during harvest and I know you've got a lot of work to get done. A lot of you unload on the go sometimes and uh, uh, you're really pumping that grain out through that unload, lo unload auger. But I'd like to see guys run that auger full and as slow as possible to uh, decrease soybean damage. Also leave a little bit in the tank until the last load. I've seen guys when, when that uh, combine tank gets empty or maybe the auger wagon tank gets empty they kind of rev it up a little bit to get the last few beans out of there but you can also hear them pinging and dinging around inside that auger and that's damaging the soybean and that's going to cause increased cleanouts and and possibly lower your premiums again make sure all augers are in good shape and are not severely worn so they're not damaging the beans before they get into the bin or get to the processor and consider the use of belt conveyors, especially uh, when loading your bin or unloading your bin. There is a cost to that, but they are probably one of the most gentlest ways to handle your soybeans when loading bins and unloading so, uh, uh, your uh, storage bins. Remember that food grade soybeans do not tolerate a lot of excessive handling. They're usually a larger soybean, running anywhere from 1,600 seeds per pound to maybe 23, 2,400 seeds per pound. So they're rather large. Uh, I know a lot of guys call them marbles because they are fairly large. And when you get beans like that, uh, just the genetics of the bean itself, it, it tends to have a thinner, more brittle seed coat. If you get into a situation in the fall where we have quick dry down, or you know, one day they're at 20% and the next day they're at, you know, ready for harvest at 12 or 13%, that's gonna weaken that seed coat a little bit. So you wanna make sure that you don't handle them too much because that seed coat on soybeans will break and cause the soybean to split. Our customers wanna buy whole soybeans, so we wanna try and minimize the amount of split or cracked seed coats that we have. Harvest moisture, uh, for our contracts and for many others, uh, 14% or less is the harvest requirement, uh, moisture requirement. Um, I don't have any problem if the plant is ready, the stems are ready, the pods are ready, uh, 14, 14.5% moisture at harvest time. If you can take them, keep the seed coat clean, and put them in a bin with aeration, go ahead and harvest them. That's going to help eliminate some of the split and damaged seed coat problems that you might have if the beans were like down at uh, 10 or 11%. Long-term uh, storage moisture, you know, if you are gonna be putting them in the bin at 14, 14.5% is to keep the air on once you start harvest and bring that moisture down to about 12 or 13% for long-term uh, storage moisture. Immature stems or weeds, again, uh, the pods and the beans always seem to be ready before the stems are, especially the last couple of years where we've had the long fall we haven't had a frost until almost the end of October. Uh, having that frost at the normal time or maybe even just to touch on the early side sometimes helps soybean harvest because it really ripens that plant and makes kind of evens out the field and makes it ready for harvest all at the same time. But here the last few years we've had a lot of problems with, you know, the beans in the pot are probably 12, 13, maybe 14 percent, but we still have a lot of ste yellow stems out in the field. And if we go out and harvest that, we're gonna increase our chances of uh, speckling the seed coat with dirt, and that's not gonna work for food grade soybeans. Seed coat staining, uh, dirt, weed seeds. Um, uh, again, with the long harvest uh, time we've had, uh, the long growing season, uh, no killing frost, we've had a lot of green weeds out in the field. Uh, consider harvesting around the heavy areas. Again, those green weeds are gonna have a lot of moisture in them. They're gonna pull a lot of moisture into your combine. That's gonna rub off on the seed coats. Even some of the seeds that are on those weeds are gonna uh, rub on the beans and with that extra moisture in there, it's gonna cause some weed uh, uh, or seed coats uh, staining from the weed seeds and it's just not gonna be uh, very conducive to food grade soybeans. 
Also, uh, early morning harvest and late afternoon, early evening harvest, when you see that dew setting in, I know you want to keep going, but I'd shut the combine off. Again, those plants are going to be picking up moisture at that time, and it's going to cause some concerns, again, with uh, the cleanliness of the seed coat, which is really very important with uh, food-grade soybean production. Bin storage of food grade soybeans, uh, again aeration is very important to bring the moisture down and the cool of soybeans, regardless of the outside air temperature unless it's you know really cold outside, those soybeans going into the bin have a lot of heat that they need to dissipate, so turn the aeration fans on at harvest time and I, most of the guys that I work with just keep those fans running completely through soybean harvest and maybe a week or two afterwards. Though they are monitoring the moisture content of those beans to make sure they don't get them too dry. If you have spreaders at the top of your bins, that's okay. Uh, just make sure they're spreading evenly when the beans are going into the bin, but try and keep them from throwing the beans against the wall because that's going to crack them. Also try not to peak the bin. Try to keep it nice and level at the top when you're done uh, filling the bin. That's going to help prevent moisture migration to the top and help prevent crusting problems later on during the winter or the following spring. If you do have a peak in the bin, you know, really keep a close eye on it. Make sure it doesn't start to have moisture migration. You don't see a lot of sweating on the bin roof. If you have to, core the bin. Talk to the person that's buying those beans and see if they can take a load or two out of the bin early so you can get that bin at the top nice and level and it's going to keep a lot better for you. And as with other grains, this time of the year again, acclimate the stored soybeans in the late winter or early spring as the temperatures warm. Again, make sure you move that air front through there so that the whole bean warms up even, or the whole bin warms up evenly uh, to prevent moisture accumulation and storage molds later on in the growing season. They sneak up on you fast, especially on the north sides of the bins. Uh, uh, you'll see a lot of frost accumulating on those in the mornings and in the evenings and that's where you're going to start seeing your problems if you don't get these beans warmed up again. We've talked a lot about uh, cleaning grain handling equipment and cleaning out bins, and cleaning out combines. Um, if we're going to go to all that work, let's put clean grain in the bin. Uh, we had the problems with corn a couple of years ago. Uh, with a lot of uh, ear molds and, and potential mycotoxin issues. Uh, we had guys running around the countryside looking in the fence rows and then the uh, hedgerows of a lot of farms looking for equipment like it's in the upper right or left hand corner there of the screen. Uh, they remember their dads or grandpas had those quick clean units there and that's one of the easiest ways of taking the first step to putting good clean grain in your bin that's going to help you uh, deliver a good quality product to the food processor. Um, in 2006 we had guys that would use that type of a quick clean method before their corn went into the dryer and when they would unload to bring it to our plant in Marion or up to St. Peter they would run it through one more time to see if they can get all the kernels that might be affected by those ear molds out so that their load wouldn't be rejected when it uh, arrived at our plant. And for the most part, it worked very well. Same for soybeans, you can re uh, remove a lot of uh, weed seed or sclerotia from white mold, or even immature seeds or disease seeds that might cause storage mold problems uh, throughout the winter. There's various types of uh, quick clean methods. Uh, the top two I've seen the most of here, uh, in, in the upper Midwest anyway, the one in the uh, uh, bottom left here is a little more expensive, uh, probably does a little bit better job than the other two, but uh, there is a cost factor to that too. What uh, is that anyway? I can't see the picture. The one in the bottom left? Yeah. It's, it's more like a clipper cleaner. cleaner. Right, right. And then I do have a grain vac uh, in the other corner there, and we have a lot of guys that are producing small grains for us and oats. Uh, maybe they're a little bit concerned about the amount of thins that are in their oats or FM. And when they load trucks to bring it to the mill, they use a grain fact, and that usually brings their test weight up and gets rid of a lot more FM that, that might possibly be in their bin. 
bin treatments. Um, diatomaceous earth is the one I've probably had a lot of growers use the most of. And quite honestly, I don't have a lot of growers that use bin treatments. A lot of them have been pretty good about keeping their bins clean, which again is the best way to prevent problems from storage molds and, and other insect problems, especially if that grain's gonna be in there through the following spring or summer. Uh, also by keeping, uh, if I wanna, I wanna go back one here possibly, uh, by putting clean grain in your bin too, it's gonna allow for a lot better air movement. So when you're trying to keep that grain cool in the summer, the following summer, which also is gonna help prevent the uh, uh, insects from developing and infesting your grain, it's gonna be a lot easier in that clean grain for that air to move through it if you have run it through a system like this. But those of you that wanna use diatomaceous earth, it is approved for organic production, but please notify the company that's buying your grain uh, that you are using it because they need to know that it's in that so when they receive your grain at their location and they probe it they know what to look for because they have to make sure they can get it out before they can make their product and move it on to their customer. Um, I went online last night looked up one particular product and one of the methods for an 18 foot diameter bin I believe is what they had listed there was to number one start with an empty clean bin then dust the empty bin with two pounds of DE, and they suggested uh, applying it right through the aeration fan, or just blowing it up through that, that bin, through the floor. Then as you start to load the bin, uh, treat the bottom two feet of grain with about eight pounds, pounds of DE, and that's just slowly adding it in with each load as you're putting into the bin so you got the first uh, uh, couple feet of grain inside the bin. And then you wanna layer the bin, I, I got these out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, you wanna layer the bin on every fifth load with a, about one pound of DE per ton of grain. And then the final two feet of grain, again, you wanna do the same exact treatment as you did with the first two feet of grain in the bin and apply eight pounds of DE as you load the bin. Then once your bin is full, you've got it leveled off, you've got the aeration fans off, it's ready to seal up for the winter go ahead and top dress the top of that bin with about one pounds of DE. And for the few growers that I've had use this, it, it does work. Um, but we do need to know as a food grade company that it is in your bin and it might be showing up in, in the trucks when you deliver your, 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 your product to uh, uh, our mills or our specialty uh, division. So I've gone over a lot of information. I know it's lunchtime here and people are getting hungry. But uh, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you. We do have time for a few questions, I think. Uh, Bruce has offered to help me with some of the more technical ones, especially on oak production. And um, if you have any, I'd be glad to try and answer them for you. Way in the back. On uh, food grade oats, what would be the ideal uh, harvest moisture, knowing that you do have storage, you can put these oats in? That, uh, you know, you can drive them off, take the edge off. Can you go as high as 20% moisture? Is that too high for the holes? Was that for harvest moisture? For harvest moisture. Harvest moisture votes at 20%? Yeah. That's, that's going to be too high. Okay. Well, yeah. Probably about, probably about 14, 15%. They do that a lot in Canada. 14, 15% is very common up there now that they're straight cutting. Uh, you know, the problem in Canada now with all small grains, because uh, in conventional, it's okay to desiccate. They're starting already when the oats are like 18%, you know, they'll desiccate the crop with, with glyphosate and then, you know, or wheat or whatever. But when it comes then to a food grade facility like us, Sorry, Greg. Um, for organic, particularly, and for food grade, you know, you really shouldn't be harvesting the oats over about 15% moisture, and then you got to get air on them right away. You know, turn them. The more you can handle the oats, you know, the old rule of thumb, you know, what our grandfathers and stuff said, when the oats look like they're ready, when that top kernel is nice and white and bright, 
go to the fair for three days and then come home and swath the oats. Because by then, that bottom part of that panicle, that Christmas tree type head, was physiologically mature and was down to that 15% or so. Then they would go ahead and, and, and could harvest it and stuff. But um, it isn't so much that they're gonna spoil right away. It's if you harvest them above that, because of the moisture variance in that panicle, a lot of those bottom kernels aren't gonna be fully uh, fully done and you're gonna suffer test weight. And that's what they're finding out you know, the conventional people up in Canada with the glyphosate, all of a sudden their thins are up, their test weights are down, and they're going, what the hell? You know, and it's, duh, you know, think about it. So. Yes, sir? How do we get you a uniform sample out of them, especially if we're gonna paint on the way out? And can we go, how do you do that from the top to bottom? <clears throat> For soybeans um, and corn, we recommend every load, you know, get some five gallon buckets and of course clean them out. And every load that comes in, uh, if you're running it through a quick clean before it goes into the bin, you know, after it goes through that quick, quick clean uh, or when it comes out of the dryer, if you're not using a quick clean, take a, like a soup can sample, you know, every so often or every truckload like for soybeans put it in that bucket i've got yeah. growers that will uh for like for soybeans for example they'll take a soup can full of beans out of every hopper of every truck and then when they get to the halfway point in the bin they'll put that bucket to one side then they'll start a new bucket for the top half of the bin and they'll give me two samples so i have a, a better picture of it um, that's probably the easiest and, and, and most uniform way. Uh, there are companies that'll go out there for a price and go out with cherry pickers and 16 foot probes and probe down through the bin, but I don't really think that's a whole lot more accurate than actually taking samples from every truck load or every hopper load. And, and then mixing them up you know, within that bucket and sending a representative sample in at that point in time. Okay, um, once we have our contract with you and we're calling for delivery, uh, number one, we're gonna need, before we even call for delivery, we want your most current organic certificate and uh, affidavit that shows what crops are certified on that certificate. Second, um, we will want an organic bill of lading and a lot of those also double as a clean truck affidavit. And if they're your trucks, you know, make sure you do clean out the trucks and you sign that and, and make sure it's clean. If you're hiring the trucks done, or if we, for some reason, have sent the trucks up there for you, uh, a lot of times those truckers will have that clean truck affidavit already filled out because they've been through a wash bay. Uh, but crawl up there and, and make sure they actually did get everything uh, cleaned out, check the hopper gates, check the tarp, uh, check all the corners and, and make sure it is cleaned out because you know, they're gonna get paid regardless if that load gets rejected or not. You know, you need to double check and make sure that that truck is cleaned out and then you can sign off on it also. We also require that uh, the, the hopper bottom gates are sealed and that the tarp is sealed. And we wanna make, a lot of times the truck driver is gonna bring those seals with him. For our contract growers, a lot of times we'll send you the, the uh, organic bill of lading clean truck affidavit with our letterhead on it. We'll also send you some seals, but make sure those seals get put on the truck in those three locations while the truck is still in your yard and you write the seal numbers down on that organic bill of lading. If we don't receive those at the plant, the load's not gonna be accepted. One more thing. Uh, we'll get to it in just a second. I wanna add on to the question about sampling a bin, you know, going forward. Uh, back in the days when I was still work, working with Quaker and Frito-Lay, we did a lot of work with Charlie Herberg at Iowa State and Kurt, uh, Dirk Meyer when he was at Purdue. And, you know, 
I always thought it was interesting when Dirk started talking about the changes in the way that we've stored grain the last 50 years. You know, why do we inherently seem to have more mold problems and stuff today? It's because we went, and, and Dirk did this in a, in a presentation down at K-State that I saw a few years ago. He had a pile of grain on the ground. He had a pile of grain in a Quonset hut. He had uh, a concrete silo. He had an old granary, the old wooden types, you know, that could roll through the center and unloaded like we had on my farm. And then he had uh, a brand new steel 50,000 bushel bin with a dryer unit on it. He said, which one's going to have the best quality grain in it? Which one do you think? Wooden. The wooden granary, because it breathed. You know, the grain actually w was able to breathe. As long as you kept the insects out of it and the water out of it, it was the best way. Dirk honestly called a lot of these big steel, you know, monuments to prosperity in farming a crock pot. So when it comes to the concept of sampling a bin, think of it when you take the lid off of a crock pot. Where are you going to have most of your variants? On that outside edge, on the top, particularly this time of the year going forward, because I can guarantee you there's a difference between the north side of that bin and the south side of the bin because the sun shine out there like that. If you have seven degrees variance from one side to the other, you get moisture, condensation. So you want to measure both sides of those tops, and then if possible, if you can pull some grain, you know, most of these bins are center uh, feed and stuff, Move a, move a load of grain, take a wagon and take your sample out of that and the, and the edges. You're going to have, if you have a problem, that's where you're going to find it. What's the question? Well, back on the parking issue, um, I know in, in my business um, relationships, we got into a point where we use so many different trucking firms that we we started requiring a previous load history with each truck. We wanted to know what did you haul before? And we were, I mean, we were requiring washouts, but still we wanted to know what possible residues so that we didn't get something that would make it through a wash mark. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And on, on our clean truck affidavits, we do have a, 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 a slot there for previous load. So we, we do want to know that also. And a lot of times we'll call the trucking company and verify that just to make sure. Or when we're lining up the trucks, we'll tell them, you know, it's fine that he had a previous load and he washes out, but we don't want maybe fertilizer or, or DDGs or something like that being the previous load. Because with DDGs, you could get a, a GMO contamination issues. That's a that, good point. Okay, well, in closing, again, uh, we, do, we do have uh, materials at our booth over here that talk about a lot of things that I discussed in this presentation. Uh, feel free to come pick one up or pick our brains over there for the rest of the afternoon. I appreciate your time here today, and I want to, again, want to thank uh, Aaron and Harriet No Brains for putting this on. I think it's been a really nice conference, and I think they deserve a round of applause.